What's going on, everyone? Going to the history to here today to talk to you about a ship known as the Blue Bell and the tragedy that took place on the ship more than 60 years ago. The Blue Bell was a 60 foot twin masted sailing catch based out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The ship was scuttled following an act of mass murder by the ship's captain, Julian Harvey, on November 12, 1961. The final complement of the Blue Bell consisted of 40 year old Arthur Duperolt his wife Jean, and their three children, Brian, Terry Joe, and Renee. Duperolt was a successful contact lens optometrist. He and his family resided in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and he had a long dream of taking his wife and children on a week-long family cruise from the Florida Keys to the Bahamas, which he had sailed during his World War II service as opposed to the families facing another cold Wisconsin winter. For several years, the Duperolts had saved money for this opulent experience. By the summer of 1961, the Duperolt family had saved enough money to finance this cruise. The family planned to spend a week living at sea aboard a chartered yacht in a warm climate, docking at several chosen locations, and possibly extending the sabbatical if they enjoyed themselves. The family arrived in Fort Lauderdale in early November, where they chartered the 60-foot catch, the Blue Bell, stationed at the Bahia Mar Marina for $515. Duperot hired a well-known local yachtsman, 44-year-old Julian Harvey, with whom he was acquainted, to skip with the vessel for $100 per day. Harvey's sixth wife, 34-year-old former stewardess and aspiring writer Mary Dean Harvey, was also appointed to serve as a cook on the catch. The Duperot family boarded the Blue Bell at Around midday on Wednesday, November 8, 1961, the vessel was last seen leaving port early that afternoon. Over the following four days, the family traveled to locations such as Bimini and Sandy Point, where the Duperolts purchased souvenirs and engaged in activities such as snorkeling. On November 12th, at the final port of call prior to returning to Florida, Duperold and Captain Harvey visited the office of the British District Commissioner Roderick Pender, to whom Duperold stated, This has been a once in a lifetime vacation, added, We'll be back before Christmas. That evening, all aboard the Blue Bell ate a meal of chicken cacciatore and salad. Shortly thereafter, 11 year old Terry Joe walked below deck to her sleeping cabin as her family and the Harveys remained on deck. At approximately 12.35 p.m. on Monday, November 13th, a crew member aboard an oil tanker, Gulf Lion, observed a man waving frantically from a dignity, drifting in their direction and shouting, Help! I have a dead baby on board. Pulling the man aboard, crew members observed the deceased body of a red-haired, prepubescent girl wearing a life jacket inside the dinghy. The man identified himself as Julian Harvey, a skipper of the Catch Blue Bell. Harvey explained that at approximately 8.30 the previous evening, a small vessel was hit by a sudden small squall that caused the Blue Bell to rapidly keel over and the main mast to snap at a location between the uh, Abaco Islands and Great Stirrup Cay. Slightly injuring his wife and Duperolt and piercing the ship's hull, according to Har- Harvey, he was completely separated from all others on board, the catch by this failing mast and the resultant loose rigging, which resulted uh, down the mizzen. He attempted to retrieve a wire cutting from the cabin to clear the deck space, but a sudden fire broke out on board the small vessel, and he was not able to rescue his wife or any of his passengers. Forced to abandon the catch alone on a dinghy, the body of seven-year-old Rene Duperolt had soon floated by, and he had retrieved her body and attempted to revive the child. Unsuccessfully in this medical effort, he had kept her body alongside him in the raft out of respect. An autopsy later revealed the child had died of drowning. Harvey was taken to Nassau, and Harvey was questioned by authorities. Although his calm demeanor and the fact that his dinghy had been filled with various survival supplies caused some to initially express serious doubts as to his claims, Harvey's story could not be disproven, and he was allowed to return to Miami on November 15th to face further questioning by the United States Coast Guard. Three days later, on November 16th, a child was rescued in the Northwest Providence Channel by the Greek freighter Captain Theo. Second officer, Nicholas Bandakakis, observed her floating aboard a 2 by 5 foot cork float approximately one mile from the freighter. Spadakakis immediately summoned Captain Stellanos Costadontis to the bridge 
and the two gradually realized Spontacacus sighting was not a fishing vessel, but a small, oblong, white raft carrying a young, blonde-haired child dressed in white cotton blouse and pink corduroy slacks, leaning backwards and waving feebly. The captain ordered the freighter's engine stopped and a life raft lowered. Noting sharks circling close to the cork float, crew members shouted at the child not to jump into the water, with one crew member, Evangelos Castellanos, lifted the child aboard the raft. She was then hoisted aboard the Captain Theo and placed in a spare cabin. Aboard the freighter, the crew rapidly discovered the child was incoherent and barely able to speak. She was given water and orange juice as salt was sponged from her body with white towels and Vaseline applied to her lips. She hoarsely identified herself as 11-year-old Terry Duo Duperolt, informing the cr- crew that she had been floating aboard the cork float for several days after the sinking of her vessel. Her ability to speak rapidly waned, and the child soon responded to questions by winking gesturally before relapsing into a semi-comatose state. The crew of the Captain Theo did not retrieve the cork float upon which Terry Joe had drifted for almost four days. However, a member of the Coast Guard did locate and retrieve the raft from the ocean several days later. The raft had almost fallen apart and almost immediately began to disintegrate in the hands of this individual. The captain of the, of the Captain Theo immediately informed the United States Coast Guard of the discovery and the child's medical predicament, and a rescue helicopter was soon summoned, Terry Joe suffering from sun, severe sunburn, dehydration, and exposure, was airlifted to a hospital in critical condition. Three hours later, having been in airlifted to a Miami hospital, Terry Joe began to slowly recuperate, although for over two days she was unable to divulge to the police or the Coast Guard the circumstances surrounding her rescue and the truth of what actually happened to her family and Mary Dean Harvey. By November 20th, Terry Joe had regained sufficient strength to reveal to the investigators the truth about the loss of the Bluebell and its passengers. Later on November 12th, the Bluebell began to return its journey to Fort Lauderdale. At around 9 p.m., Terry Joe had entered the lower cabin to sleep, leaving her parents, siblings, Harvey, and his wife on deck. Later that evening, she was awakened by the sounds of her brother screaming and calling for his father in heavy football falls, which she decided to investigate. Above deck, she observed the bodies of her brother and mother in the main cabin, not far from the galley. Walking further onto the deck, Terry Joe then observed Harvey carrying a bucket. He had simply struck her and shoved her below deck, shouting, get back down there. The terrified child returned to her cabin, only to observe oil and water beginning to gush onto the floor of her cabin, Approximately 15 minutes later, Harvey then entered her cabin with what appeared to be a rifle in his right hand. The two made eye contact, but Harvey did not shoot her, simply returning above deck. Terry Joe then heard hammering sounds. Shortly thereafter, Terry Joe returned to the deck, only to observe Harvey standing on the deck and the vessel's dinghy floating on the port side. He then asked the child, is the dinghy loose? To which she replied she did not know. Harvey then ordered her to hold a rope attached to the dinghy while he retrieved something. By the time Harvey returns, the child rope has slipped from her fingers. In response, Harvey dove overboard and swam towards the dinghy, abandoning Terry Joe in the sinking vessel. Recollecting the small oblong cork float lashed to the, to the deck, Terry Joe untied this float as the boat deck began to sink beneath the ocean. She then threw the float over the side of the deck before swimming towards the life raft, pushing the float further into the open water before climbing onto the float. She had then drifted upon the sea for almost three and a half days without food, water, or shelter. Her life raft had begun was so, so small, Terry Joe had to sit upright for the entire ordeal, during which she had repeatedly prayed for her rescue. Terry Joe was adamant that the mast of the bluebell was intact and that there had been no fire aboard the vessel. And the sea was calm throughout the entirety of the events prior to the sinking. Shortly thereafter, she was informed that Harvey had been picked up alive three days prior to herself in a life raft, alongside her sister's dead body and that of the bodies of her parents. Her brother and Harvey's wife had all been lost at sea. On November 16th, Harvey reiterated his story to the United States Coast Guard investigators that a sudden squall had brought down the Bluebell's mast, holding the ship's hull, rupturing the auxiliary gas tanks, and starting a fire, the circumstances of which made it impossible for him to rescue his wife or any member of the Duperolt family. Harvey also claimed that he had found Renee's body floating in the water and that he had tried unsuccessfully to revive the child. On November 17th, midway through Harvey's scheduled interrogation, he was informed that Terry Joe had been rescued the previous day and that her condition was improving. His response was to exclaim, Oh my God, before quickly and calmly adding, Isn't that wonderful? 
Lieutenant Ernest Murdoch then informed Harvey that an official investigation into the loss of the Bluebell and her passengers was to be launched that day. Shortly thereafter, he asked to be excused from further interrogation, claiming he was tired and that he wished to speak with his wife's family. His request was granted. Harvey then drove a short distance towards Biscayne Boulevard, where he checked into the Sandman Hotel under the assumed name of John Monroe, paying cash for a room. He then penned a two-page suicide note before committing suicide by slashing his thigh, ankles, and jugular vein with a razor blade in the motel bathroom. His body was found by a maid approximately two hours later. The suicide note addressed to a close friend from his days of military service was found in a dresser within the room adjacent to his body. This note left no explanations or apologies for his actions, but simply ended with the words, I got too tired and nervous. I couldn't stand it any longer. The note also requested the recipient take care of his 14-year-old son, Lance, and that he be buried at sea. Given such evidence of foul play from the sole survivor of the Bluebell and the Harvey's subsequent suicide, an investigation was launched into Harvey's recent history. The inquiry revealed Harvey, a decorated World War II veteran and Korean War pilot, had difficulty holding a job for any length of time, had serious financial problems, and recently arranged a double indemnity insurance policy on the life of his wife just two months before their July 1961 marriage. Furthermore, just one month prior to the Duperod family chartering the Bluebell, Harvey had been hired by the vessel's owner, businessman Harold Pegg, to take any tourists to sea upon their desired cruises in exchange for $300 a month and a free accommodation aboard the catch. This agreement may have formulated Harvey's plan to murder his wife at sea and then claim that she had been vanished, with tourists viewed in his mind as valuable witnesses to corroborate his claims. The Harvey's first chartered clients were the Duperod's family. The conclusion of the Harvey of the inquiry was that Harvey had planned to kill his wife to collect on her 20000 double indemnity clause policy, which would yield double the insured sum if she died accidentally. However, Harvey may have been observed by author Duperold either in the act of the murder of his wife or the disposal of her body. Harvey had then proceeded to kill Duperold, his wife, and two of his children. Many may have witnessed his murder. Furthermore, he had later likely retrieved Renee's body from the ocean to add credibility to his story. In closure, the inquiry concluded that had Harvey not committed suicide, he would have been prosecuted for the murder of those who had died aboard the Bluebell and the attempted murder of Terry Joe. Following the loss of her family, Terry Joe returned to Green Bay to live with her father's sister, her grandmother, and three cousins in the city of Depery. She refused to part with the blouse and slacks she was wearing at the time of her rescue. The following year, she changed her first name to Terry, in part due to her refusal to be viewed as a victim. Due to contemporary psychological coping strategies in the early 1960s, authorities figures very seldom spoke with Terry Joe about her ordeal, and she received no trauma counseling. Consequently, she did not speak publicly about the loss of her family and her survival ordeal for over 20 years. Terry Joe later married and bore three children. As an adult, she chose to live and work close to the ocean. She is now retired and lives in Kewanee, Wisconsin. In 2010, Terry Jo Duperolt, Fastbender, released her memoir alone, Orphaned on the Sea, co-authored by psychologist and survival expert Richard Logan. This book details her family's final cruise, her Harvey's murder of her family, and his wife, the three and a half days she spent drifting upon the cork float prior to her rescue and her life in the years since. 49 years after the, the ordeal, Terry Joe granted a televised interview with the morning te- television show host Matt Lau, in which she stated, I think he probably thought I would go down with the ship. She also stated her belief Harvey had originally intended to discreetly murder his wife and dispose of her body, later to claim she was lost at sea. But his wife likely fought her husband, attracting the attention of her family. Terry Joan has also stated she did not wish for people to reflect upon her ordeal in opine. Gee, that poor little girl, but rather to think to themselves, she had gone on with her life. Terry Jo had also stated she has always believed I was saved for a reason. If one person heals from a life tragedy after reading my story, my journey will have been worth it. Please subscribe to the channel if you thought this was an interesting story. And leave down some comments down below. Like this video. As always, continue with the history and film. Until next time, have a great day, everyone.